Welcome everyone. Today we're going to be discussing how to apply statistics into research data management when you're conducting your research plan. And today we're going to have an interview with Nigel Yokoz, who is a professor here at UIT in Statistical Ecology at the Department of Marine Biology. So research data management is a really important tool for researchers. It helps them to effectively plan and, res and execute research projects, while also keeping in mind how to long-term preserve their data. So today we're going to discuss statistics in this uh, topic and how statistics can promote a well-organized and successful research project. So Nigel, can you give us a brief introduction to yourself and tell us what you do here at UIT? Yeah, so <coughs> thanks, Cathy, for the introduction. Um, um, I work at the UIT since 2003, so I've been here for you know, about 20 years. Um, <coughs> I say I'm a statistical ecologist, and that means that I have an education in biostatistics originally, but I am also a field ecologist. So I, I spend quite much time uh, working on Arctic and Alpine ecosystems, so cold ecosystems, so being in Tromsø is really the right mm -hmm. place. Uh, and I do quite a bit of field work, uh, so gathering my own data and uh, having my own study designs and so on. So I really like the, the way to do everything from gathering the data to analyzing the data, and then publishing, of course, uh, of the course. results. Of course. Wonderful. Okay, thanks very much, Nigel. So the first thing we want to talk about is how we might integrate statistics into the planning phase of a research project. So at the beginning of a research project, mm -hmm. in the planning phase, before you start collecting any data, or uh, creating any data, how do you think knowledge and skills and statistics could affect your approach to the research project? I think the, the first thing, on, uh, we are doing science. And when we do science, we start with a question. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first thing you, people should really think about it is how to translate your question in a way that makes it possible to analyze the data. That is, uh, very often we have relatively vague on general question, mm -hmm. and one has to really make them concrete in terms of what it will mean when you want to analyze the data. So really that's the first, I think, uh, thing that people should start with. And then, of course, uh, uh, statistics is uh, more than analyzing data. Uh, on <coughs> what I think is really uh, important is thinking of study design, that is, uh, what kind of uh, information you will collect, how you will select your units, for example, if you work in social science, what kind of people you want to involve in your surveys and so on. On something also that uh, I think people often forget uh, about uh, in terms of statistics is measurement. That is how you are going to measure what you are interested in and thinking of really of the quality of your measurements. It's something that very often people forget about uh, when starting a PhD and so on, is really uh, how you, you're going to measure things. And then, of course, the last part is really uh, how you are going to analyze the data. And I guess we will come back to this when we think about data management plan. So having a very thoughtful approach to your research project is quite critical. And um, but one way we could do that, help assist that, is by writing a very nice data management plan where you answer all those questions that you just brought up. So you're thinking about every step of the research plan, mm -hmm. how you're going to approach data collection, how you're going to make sure the data is good quality by having standard analyses and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, the next topic is to think about how we might integrate statistics into when we're actively doing the research. So when we're actively collecting data or generating data, and we're, we're, we're collecting in this data in order to address the hypothesis or the research question, what, why do you think knowledge and skills and statistics are important when we're actively collecting data? Yeah, it's really uh, thinking of, again, the quality of the data. For example, when we collect data in, in social sciences or in ecology, there could be a lot of selection processes going on. That is, we, we have planned to acquire uh, a given sample of data on a given population, and things don't go according to the plan. And we have to really then to think carefully about uh, how this will affect in a way, the, the, the data we get and the results we may get at the mm -hmm. end. And it can be the same thing in terms of uh, in other fields. That is, when we collect the data, that is the really understanding the sources of biases that can affect how we are going to analyze the results. I think it's something that uh, very often we, we forget when we uh, see the final results, is that there are really many choices that have been made mm -hmm. uh, along the process of collecting the data. And these choices are not apparent in the, the final product you know, when we publish papers. Hmm. And, uh, I think this is also some where really the data management plan is important because it really should aim at making these choices, this uh, selection that very often we have to do, 
uh, apparent. And then obviously to record these choices or this, these new directions in your data collection into your data management plan. Mm -hmm. So you remember in a few months time or a few years time when it comes to writing up these these research projects and yeah. publications. Exactly. Yeah. So really to have uh, to tracking yes. uh, these different uh, choices that we make uh, so that we can really integrate this at the end and we can over uh, people can really understand yes. uh, and compare to what they did. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so if we want to use statistics to maximize our research efficacy, so sometimes during data collection analysis, like you just said, we have to make choices. We may find we need more data, we may need to change our approach, our collection, collection methodology, we may need to run some different standards. Um, but this may prove maybe very costly or logistically even impossible if you have to collect data only in a certain season or you're controlled by some external factor. Um, how can we use uh, statistics to help us pl plan and conduct research projects to sort of be the most effective when conducting our research? Yeah, ideally, uh, one should try to, in a way, uh, for example, before we one starts the study, mm -hmm. to, for example, simulate data mm -hmm. according to what we hope to get mm -hmm. when we do the real field work, for example, or the surveys and so on, so that uh, one can really assess if uh, it will be possible to, to get the information that we are really uh, aiming at. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really a concern that in many fields uh, in science, people collect too little, too few data. And we, you get what is called uh, technically this kind of uh, low powered uh, studies. Mm -hmm. That is the, the precision of the estimates that you get at the end will be much too low. Mm -hmm. And basically uh, you end up with studies where it's not that you, you can answer this is not happening, is that in fact you don't know what is happening. That is the, you have very little uh, idea about if for example your effect is small or large or close to zero. Mm -hmm. And I think doing this kind of preliminary work uh, to s assess really uh, if we have a, a reasonable chance mm -hmm. to get the answer where we are after is something that people should really invest more time in. Okay, so what you're saying is it's really important, if you can, to sort of model what you need to do. And then when you're in the field or in the lab, whatever, whatever is your method, collect a lot of data, if yeah, you can. I, it's a question I have gotten uh, hundreds of times. <laughs> uh, how large should my sample be? Yes. And I always answer, yeah, the obvious question, uh, as large as you can. Right, as long as you can. <laughs> but uh, can. I, I think it's important that people don't uh, start studies where they have very, very little chance to mm -hmm. get a sample which, in fact, will be large enough to give a good answer. Right, okay. So it's a very, I think, a waste of time on research on money, on especially for the PhD, for PhD students. Yes. Uh, it's really not very nice when you start to study and at the end you realize that you, yeah, you could not feasible. answer your question. Right, so you want to decrease the risk by sort of having, thinking about what you need to do and if it's feasible mm, yeah. before you do it. Mm. That sounds like a good idea. Um, all right, so in your opinion, when we talk about statistics and research data management, when you're sort of analyzing the data, what would be, in your opinion, some pitfalls in data analysis that result from a lack of knowledge in statistics? So maybe you didn't write a thorough data management plan, maybe you didn't think about the sample size that's required um, in order to thoroughly evaluate whatever your research question or your hypothesis mm -hmm. is. So what are the common pitfalls in data analysis, do you think, that you encounter? So I think there are two aspects here. You have more the technical aspects, mm -hmm. uh, that is you choose the wrong uh, methods to analyze the data. Mm -hmm. uh, you ignore really very important sources of biases, for mm -hmm. example. And that's clearly, okay, that's, I would say technical. It's very important. When I say technical, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't ignore them. But mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's the, the first aspect that is uh, ignoring these kind of, of mm -hmm. problems. Uh, the other aspect is that when uh, scientists uh, analyze data, uh, as we discussed, they have to make many choices. Mm -hmm. uh, some people call it degrees of freedom in the sense that you have to choose which method you use, which uh, part of the sample you use. Uh, a famous statistician, Andrew Gelman, talked about the garden of fork and pass. Mm -hmm. That is, usually you have this uh, kind of uh, decide, uh, you go left, you go right, you mm -hmm. go left and you go right. And this is really many decisions you have to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you ignore, in a way, uh, uh, in the final product that what you have is in a way a result of all these choices, uh, you might really get a very biased view of, uh, in a way, the, the results, in fact, that are, uh, you could draw from your study. Hmm. So ignoring all this selection. And that has been shown now in many uh, fields of sciences. 
that this kind of selection process has led really to results that we cannot reproduce. Mm. They, are re they reflect more the choices made by the scientists okay. than really what is happening in the, the systems that people study. That's very interesting that the bias can exert such a, such a control mm. on the results. Mm. And reproducibility is a, is a big issue and you always want to be reproducible so that people can use your work and integrate it into their research mm. and get citations mm. obviously which is very mm. important especially when you're an early career researcher. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is statistics and the open science movement. Uh, if you're movement, uh, familiar with the open science movement, it ensures that not only do you publish your research data, but also any notes or any supporting information that sort of goes along with the holistic research project. So this can include methodology, maybe those choices that you just discussed, where you took the forks in the path. Um, it can also be any statistical methods that you use to process, clean, analyze data. So how the movement towards open science, what do you think, how does that intersect with your expectations of people's statistical knowledge? Do you think having open science will improve researchers' level of statistical knowledge? No, I think it, this is the open science uh, sort of movement or whatever you call it, I think it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. And I'm really convinced that this will really improve uh, how statistical methods are used uh, on science in general. Mm -hmm. uh, because as we just discussed of really uh, avoiding that these uh, choices that are made uh, are hidden in the, in, in the final uh, papers, the formal that people publish. Mm -hmm. uh, on <coughs> it is something we, in our group, for example, we, we are uh, setting up an, what we call an observatory, so QUAT, the Climate Ecological Observatory of Arctic Tundra, it's a bit mm -hmm. uh, mouthful. But uh, we, it's an observatory we, we make available both the data that we acquire in the field mm -hmm. uh, and also all the analytical steps uh, that we use to make, uh, to pr produce papers or to make figures that uh, we make available for people. Mm -hmm. And we try to, you know, we try, we uh, make available all the different choices on the, we have what we call scripts, mm -hmm. where really the, 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 how the analysis have been done are really explicit. Uh, so people can really assess uh, everything we did from the field work mm -hmm. uh, to the final product. Um, there is no right way often to do things. It's really important that people can compare and say, okay, what would happen if I had done it differently? Mm -hmm. Fine, that's really something important. Right. And uh, I think the open science uh, movement from having access to data, access to analytical choices, and then really how it, it links to the questions we ask, this is really, uh, I think, the way forward. And I really, I do hope that really the, the, the new generation will be much more, in a way, of, uh, going forward to, to do this. Yeah, I think open science is a really a, a powerful movement. And I think it's important to know that people shouldn't be afraid of open science. It's really a good thing. There's, mm -hmm. As you said, there's no right or wrong way. But it's important that you did show your path, sort of the, the, the how the data was generated mm -hmm. to how it was processed. And that helps you understand the interpretations of the study mm. and lets you also assist your interpretations of mm -hmm. your own data. Mm. Okay. But just, I think the, you had the right word is that uh, I think some people are really afraid of it. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I think especially for PhD students, I think you should really not be afraid of uh, You're open not science. messing up. No one's no, going to be angry at you for showing no, your no, methodology. And I think sharing your data and the experience we have had, it's in fact, it means that people are using them. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is really some, a way to really get known with other people or to get your work to be known, instead mm -hmm. of having your data in a way hidden, and mm -hmm. very often they get forgotten really quickly. Yes. So don't be afraid of uh, yes. open science. Publish your data, publish your methodology. It's good. Mm. OK, lastly, let's talk specifically about the application of statistics for students or candidates who are doing their PhD. So when you're doing your PhD, it's not just you alone. Usually you're included in a team of skilled researchers, so your supervisor, the professor, other PhD students, maybe some postdoctoral researchers, and maybe you're all conducting sort of separate parts of a more holistic research project. So usually when you conduct any research project, you have to do some statistical uh, analysis of your data. But in a larger team, uh, you know, you, perhaps there's a feeling students could maybe ask other people to help them with that sort of statistical um, treatment. But how much statistical knowledge do you think PhD students should should know, should have with them during their degree? Yeah. That's a difficult question because, of course, it depends a lot on the field of that course, you, yes. you work in. But I think the, m all PhD students should have a really basic understanding of the, you know, say the statistical principles. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, for example, when we talk about statistical evidence, 
uh, what does it mean? So uh, when they talk to statisticians, and they should try to really to understand, okay, do I have you know, in my data, in my research project, do I have good evidence that this or that is happening? Mm -hmm. So I think there is, there is really some basic understanding of principles that is, should really be common to all PhD students. Uh, and then, of course, uh, depending on the field, you, you have to uh, have some understanding of the, the techniques, not the, not the technical aspects, but really understanding why they are used in that way uh, on how it relates, for example, to, as we discussed before, me measurement quality or the sources of biases in the way you have selected your samples and so on. So at least that they, they understand the different choices that are made uh, when analyzing the data on writing papers mm -hmm. so that they, they, they can... When you are a co-author of any paper, people have the tendency to forget that you stand for the whole paper. Mm -hmm. You don't stand only for your small bit in the, in the paper. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand the, the whole process from the acquiring the data to writing the paper. Okay. Well, that's been really interesting. I think, it's, I think we've learned some things today. It's that to really think about, think thoughtfully mm -hmm. about your research project and plan, uh, plan as much as you can. Think about how you're going to collect the data, uh, make sure you have enough data. And then also when you're doing the research project actively to really record all the steps and choices that you make mm -hmm. in a data management plan or another platform and really prepare yourself to share your data openly you know, with publication but also with, um, with open science and making sure that ever, all researchers can see how you conducted your data. Mm -hmm. So thanks so much, Nigel, today for joining us. That's been really instructive. And uh, I hope everyone learned something from this talk today. Thank you, Katie. <laughs>